So welcome everybody uh, and online as well. It is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Johan Knappen. Those of you who are working in uh, dynamics or sparamorphology, you know the name. Uh, Johan is uh, coming from the Instituto Astrofisica de Canarias. He is head of the research department, I think, there. And uh, he's also affiliated with a couple of uh, universities in the UK. Uh, he's uh, a long, uh, uh, many years work uh, of work in the field of uh, dynamics and spiral morphology and all that stuff. And uh, as you see already on the screen today, he will speak about the evolution. Uh, uncovering galaxy history through deep imaging and machine learning, a topic that is also uh, interesting for several of us here from different, different, yeah, please come in. Yeah. Uh, from different viewpoints. Now we will see how this apply in uh, deep imaging of uh, spiral galaxies. So, Johan, you can start, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Panos. Thank you for the welcome. Uh, hello, people there in the room and also people online. It, it's great to see old friends again and, and meet new people. Uh, so my talk is going to be, it, it's got a, a grand title. I won't discuss this in, in great detail, of course, galaxy history. That that's that could be days of uh, talking. So but I'll, I'll give some examples on what we do in our group on deep imaging and on and machine learning. Um, so I'll start off if I can manage. There we go. Uh, I'll start off talking a little bit about galaxy morphology, uh, which studying that really is one of the main tools that we have for understanding galaxies and to understand, therefore, their formation and, and evolution of, of galaxies. Galaxy morphology dates back many years, of course. It's just looking at the images of galaxies. That's how it started. Uh, and and the several sophisticated modern approaches was include the detailed classification of galaxy, looking at components, and then uh, going on to automation of the process. So on the left here, you see, I don't know if you can see my pointer, I guess you can. Uh, this is a picture uh, from work by Ronald Buta, who really is one of the experts, maybe the expert on uh, classifying individual galaxies by looking at them and recognizing their individual components. So when you do this and you look, for instance, at this image of NGC 3081, uh, you end up with a classification that looks like this, where it's got an outer ring. Uh, it's a spiral galaxy type AB, so it has a, a bar, but not a very strong bar. It has an inner ring, which is the little R component, uh, and it's an S0 and maybe an SA type. So this is what you can just see by eye on images. And, and this has worked well so far. We have catalogs where this is listed. Uh, we've done this in the S4G survey uh, for a couple of thousand galaxies, but now coming into Euclid and LSST uh, eras where we'll have millions of galaxies, this is not an approach that that really uh, is, is future proof. So in the middle, you see an, another approach. This is the, the so-called CAS system, which is three parameters that can be easily automated uh, from galaxy images. So this uh, quantifies uh, the, 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 the concentration of galaxies, the asymmetry, and, and the smoothness of parameter in galaxies. And with those three parameters, uh, you can do a lot in terms of uh, putting galaxies into their different morphology boxes. And on the right is an illustration of a modern approach, which uses uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to look at images and sort them in different uh, categories. OK, then. One aspect of morphology of galaxies, apart from obviously spirals and ellipticals and irregulars, is looking at the faint structures uh, around them. And that can be truncations at the end of a disk, uh, where the disk of a galaxy ends. Uh, we can talk about thick disks, about halos outside galaxies, the tidal streams that we can observe that uh, connect different that have been interacting, and many other features which are really very faint. Uh, the main models of cosmological galaxy formation and evolution predict that interactions and mergers are important in shaping the current day galaxies. And the direct results of these processes, uh, we find various forms of structure in the outer parts of galaxies, uh, as well as a population of very faint dwarf galaxies. So this comes directly out of the main cosmological models, uh, and it's something that so far has been very hard to observe. 
the the interesting thing is that because these very faint structures uh, are quite relaxed, they have long dynamical time scales. There isn't much going on to them once they form. Then that means that the results of these early processes in the universe survive longer and that their evolution is slower. So it's important to study all these faint structures, uh, but you need deep imaging and that comes with its problems. So how to observe the low surface brightness universe or the LSB universe? There's two main approaches. <clears throat> On the left, you see here what we call star counting, uh, where you look at individual stars in an image of, of a nearby galaxy uh, and basically count the stars and, and look at their look at their parameters, uh, their colors, position, magnitudes, etc. The advantage there is that you can reach extremely low surface brightness. Uh, this has been done mainly for, for Andromeda, Andromeda galaxies and galaxies, other galaxies in the local group. And you can reach extremely low uh, surface brightness levels. The, the disadvantage is that, of course, you must be able to see the stars. And that means it's only available in the very local universe. It also is stellar population dependent. Uh, the other approach you see on the right here is using surface photometry, basically imaging as, as you might know it from, from uh, on, on the sky. The advantage there is that it's advantage, it's available at any distance. And we've seen this in, uh, in the Hubble deep fields, it's inter, uh, et cetera. If, as long as your resolution is high enough and your exposure time is high enough and you can, you can uh, cancel all the systematic effects, you can go very deep and you can do that at any distance. Uh, the, the difficulty is that it's extremely challenging from a technical point of view because you'll, you're looking uh, at, at levels of emission from galaxies that are much uh, fainter than the emission of the, of the night sky. So the early examples of deep imaging uh, really come back to uh, the fantastic work done by David Malan uh, in Australia, where he used the Anglo-Australian telescope in the 1980s uh, to, to take photographic images uh, using photographic plates and using very specialized techniques uh, to, to photograph galaxies. And, and interestingly, David Malin was not an astronomer. He was more a chemist uh, and a photographer. Uh, but he got these fantastic, very deep images of galaxies. Uh, and here, for instance, is M83. So this is an image from, from the early 80s uh, which was revolutionary at the time, because he, he was the person really who could push this to limits where, where no one had seen before. And you can see the, the inner part of the galaxy here, that, that's a, a, color, a color image that was later put in, the, the plates were black and white. Then you see this out, outer region of the disk of the galaxy, uh, which is all this. But then outside there, there's all these plumes and, and maybe tidal features uh, that really pop up in his imaging and that had never been seen before. Uh, this was in the 1980s, and uh, Malin was certainly the best, one of the very few people who, who could do this. And then we got CCDs, which means that we got much better quality imaging in terms of spatial resolution uh, and, and reproduction of what we see in the galaxies. But the cost was that the field of view uh, became small. So for a couple of decades, really, we could do excellent imaging of galaxies and we could study the central parts of galaxies in great detail, but we were limited to relatively small fields of view. And you can see in this comparison that in this beautiful image here on the left, which I think was taken with HST, and it's got exquisite detail uh, on all kinds of aspects of this galaxy. The thing that we could not observe was this tidal feature that David Malin showed us is sitting out, out there because it's just simply not in the field of view. Uh, so this has held up the field for, for, I would say, a couple of decades because we all concentrated on the bright parts of galaxies using relatively small CCD images. Now, once you really start going into deep imaging, there's a couple of issues uh, that are all quite serious. Uh, and if you add them up, it, it gets worse, of course. The first is sky brightness. Uh, we're looking at emission that is very, uh, very many magnitudes below the emission of the night sky. Then there are internal reflections within your telescope instrument system. Uh, you have to flat field. That means that the response of the individual pixels and parts of your CCD is not, uh, is not the same in all parts of the CCD. And then you have all kinds of astronomical sources, uh, which you need to mask, and then you have to subtract the background. 
So there's all these issues that come in. And as an illustration on the right, here you see a, a deep image. This is from Stripe, Stripe 82. The galaxy here is NGC 941, but you don't see any details. It's the red blob in the middle here. Uh, this is work from Peter Zadal in 2017. This, so this is a very deep image. Here's the galaxy in the middle and around there, and, and around, oh, no, this, around there, you see all these white blobs. These are stars and background galaxies that have been masked out. And here in the top left, there's a big white area. It's just a, a relatively bright star uh, that had to be removed. And once you remove all these sources, you mask all this. Uh, and this is this is after doing your flat fielding, etc. Then you end up with this background, which you see here in these colors that you can model, which we've done here in the top right panel. So you model this, this gradient in the background. It's a bit brighter on the left. It's a bit darker, uh, a bit less bright on the right. So you can model that. But then, of course, you need to extrapolate that model under your galaxy because you can assume that the same model will apply inside the galaxy area. So we do that here by masking the galaxy and then extrapolating uh, that, that background model. And when we subtract it, we end up with the, the lower right panel, which is the galaxy now background subtracted. Uh, and, and you see the, the kind of work you have to do just to get to a background subtracted and image of, of this galaxy in a deep field. But then we're not there yet because there's scattered light. And, and the best uh, illustration I always find that scattered light really is a very nasty problem is that the sky is blue down to the horizon, uh, even if the sun is overhead. And that is scattered blue light uh, in our atmosphere uh, from the sun. And it scatters all the way down to, to 90 or even 180 degrees away. Uh, so that's what scattering does. And the picture is the Bolivian salt flats, which I was happy enough to... Uh, to visit before the pandemic, uh, the sky is blue down to the horizon all around. And that's the best illustration that scattered light is a very serious problem. Uh, and then there's another problem, which is galactic cirrus. So even if you get rid of scattered light, which can be from any extra galactic object, uh, then there's galactic cirrus left, which is emission from, uh, from, from interstellar medium in our own galaxy and in our own solar system. So that's what we get uh, in our imaging. And there is, it's, it's just there, it's always there. Uh, there are regions of the sky that are better, others are worse, um, but this is what you see. Here's an image uh, at a depth of about 28 and a half magnitude per square second. Uh, we hope to get a lot deeper than that with LSST and Euclid, for instance, and other imaging. And in, in a field which is a little bit worse than usual perhaps, but you can see this kind of structure it's everywhere and it's very hard to get rid of. So these are some of the problems that we have uh, with deep imaging. But we, we can deal with this uh, to several uh, levels of extent. Uh, we can deal with, with most of it. We can model the, scat the, the scattering, subtract the background. We can mask sources uh, and, and we can look at, look at cirrus uh, subtracted and or we also try to find patches in the sky where the cirrus is less of a problem. And, just to give you two, two examples of recent results that we got from deep imaging, I'll, I want to highlight two works uh, led by Javier Roman, who is a postdoc in, in our group and with uh, Annette Groningen. Uh, and the first of these is called, uh, the paper is called a, a Giant Thin Stellar Stream in the Coma Galaxy Cluster. Uh, this is a paper that's in press, but it's, it's on the archive. And this is Javier Roman, Michael Rich, and several other people. And then I'll talk a little bit about a nuclear star cluster information, uh, which interestingly is linked to deep imaging. So this is that paper on the giant thin stellar stream, which Javier discovered in the coma cluster. Uh, so the, the picture on the left here shows a private telescope, uh, the Gene Rich 0.7 meter telescope, uh, which, which is owned by uh, Michael Rich. He, he owns a telescope and operates it and observes with it. And what he does is, is uh, use a lot of observing time to look at the same patch on the sky. And they've done a survey called the Heron survey, looking at the number of uh, spiral galaxies relatively nearby. So with this 70 centimeter telescope, data were obtained during 2019 and 2020. Uh, and the total here is 100 hours of exposure time. So this is 50 hours in the G band and 50 hours in the R band. Um, and, and that means that with a relatively small telescope, because you can get 100 hours of exposure time, 
you can get very deep. And this is a difference, because of course, if you take an eight or a 10 meter telescope, you might be able to go as deep, but you wouldn't be able to get 100 hours of exposure, exposure time. Uh, and of course, the field of view might be smaller as well. Uh, PSF modeling was done. This is the point spec function. So this is the, the scattering of stars in the field and, and outside the field. Uh, that was modeled by observing very bright stars uh, just to see how how the scattering behaves and how far uh, how far out the light is scattered so they observed very bright stars and then as follow-up uh, as on the basis of what they found uh, with the jrt telescope they found they they observed this for 10 hours with the four meter william herschel telescope in a luminance filter a luminance filter is an optical filter which basically covers the whole optical wavelength range. So it's not like a green or a red or a blue filter. Luminance covers the whole range just to, you know, of course you lose the color information, but you get as much uh, light through your, through your filter and into your, um, into your detector as possible. So that was 10 hour deep image on the four meter Herschel telescope. And what we see is this. So on the right is the, the Heron image of the coma cluster. Uh, it's a huge mosaic, uh, a large area on the sky. And on the right is, is legacy data, uh, which is publicly available. And even from this image, you already see the difference in depth. Uh, if you look around the, around the main galaxies, you can see that on the left, they have these halos of light, uh, large areas of very faint emission, which simply are not there in the legacy data. Uh, the galaxies are smaller, and then there's, there's a maybe a bit of a hue around the main galaxies, uh, but not as much as on the left. So this is really where the difference is made uh, between the legacy data, which is already taken on four meter telescopes. This is very deep imaging in itself. And then these ultra deep images that were taken as a combination from the Herschel and the, and the 70 centimeter JRT. And you can see all these, uh, all, all these features in here. And, and the feature that we're gonna talk about, uh, you may see here, it's this streak of light uh, that is remarkably straight and, yes. very and it's sitting there. So there it is, it's, it's a giant stellar stream, about half a degree on the sky. So this really is quite large. Uh, you see it on the left here, it's on, on the top right. Uh, you see it in a bit more detail. So this is a, a faint- Can we ask a question? Is there a question? Yes. yes uh, there's, there's a question. A question if you want to... Why is the, the area around the galaxies darker? Is that a mask that you put there? Yeah. Uh, no, that, sorry, that's that's just the um, that's the color scaling that is used. Um, sorry, I should have explained that. The, the, the really deep imaging is in black and white. Uh, that's the color scale that we use. And on top of that, uh, we put the, the color image uh, of the brighter parts of the image. So the the, the deep part uh, in there, you see that the, the dark is brighter. I should have explained that. So of, of the one black is negative, white, One is negative, the other is normal colors. Exactly, yes, yes. So the, the, the deepest part is a negative image, which is really yes. the only way to highlight this, yes. So what you're referring to, these dark areas here, that's the bright part of the of the faint image, as it were. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So here's the stream, and then on the bottom right, you can see a, an amplification of the area. So that's the. Uh... So looking at what this might be, uh, the first thing is is check whether it's not galactic cirrus, which it may be, of course. And and one of the checks that you can use there is to look at far infrared emission. Uh, and by checking this against Herschel data, we find that there is no far infrared counterpart at 250 microns, which means that there's no galactic cirrus. Uh, so so it, it really is a stellar feature in the same uh, area. Uh, it's also not resolved into stars. Uh, if you look in very high resolution, it doesn't resolve out. So it, it's very unlikely to be a foreground structure. It could of course be something in the foreground in our local group, uh, at around a megaparsec distance, uh, basically some some dirt on the window, as it were, if, if you look outside uh, through a window, if you use that analogy. Uh, but it's not because we do not resolve it. If it would be a local group, tiny little feature, maybe in our own galaxy, uh, we would resolve it uh, in, 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 the, in the legacy survey images, et cetera, 
uh, we would resolve it into stars and we don't, so we can exclude that it's local group. So from this, we conclude that it is actually part of that uh, of, of, of that extragalactic thing. Now, could it be part of another group? So these are all the groups and clusters around the area. This is a massive area on the sky now that we're showing, right? The coma cluster itself is the little red circle in the center. Uh, the little tiny little red line there is is the stream. Uh, and it, what, what, what you can then look at is the, the virial radius of all these different groups uh, and, and different clusters. For instance, here's the, the M64 group, uh, which is very nearby. It's five megaparsec, but you can calculate its radius of influence, its viral radius, virial radius, sorry. And, and we find there that no other group or cluster can have this feature within its virial radius, only coma. Uh, and, and therefore, we conclude on the basis of all this that it's a thin stellar stream actually associated with coma. It's a giant coma stream. And uh, that means that it's uh, half a megaparsec long. It's 500 kiloparsec long structure. Now, of course, at this stage, we can't take spectroscopy of it yet. It's, it's far too faint for that. So we go through this different ways of reasoning uh, to, to, to deduce that it's part of the, of the coma cluster and therefore very long and very extended. Um, the, uh, the, what, what we can then do is, is start binning, uh, masking away all the galaxies and, and all the stars uh, that, that, are not, um, that are not the stream. And, and we can then uh, plot the surface brightness profile of, of the stream. And we find that the, the maximum surface brightness is about 29 and a half magnitude per square seconds in the G band. So this thing really is very, very faint. Uh, and by using these techniques, we can go down to the, we can put the background down at around 32 magnitude per square seconds. So this means as an aside that we're starting to see features at similar surface brightness levels uh, than we used to in the star counting techniques. But this happens at hundred megaparsec. This is not in our local group. Uh, so this is this is really this is very deep imaging indeed, and, and we find this stream. Now, interestingly, if you look at uh, cosmological modeling like the TNG fifty models, uh, this is work done by our co-authors uh, Laura Sales and Nushi Abasi from UCLA. Uh, you can find an analog in the TNG fifty modeling, uh, which is shown here. Uh, this, it, it's on the left, and then in different projections, you can see this uh, this stellar stream. Uh, which is found in the modeling. So these things could be common. Uh, there could be more of these in, in galaxy clusters in, in the Lambda CDM model. Uh, the problem is, of course, observing it, uh, because as I've shown you, the, the one that we found is already extremely, uh, extremely faint. And this is this you know, almost by definition, because we found this one, almost by definition, this will be uh, one of the one of the brighter ones of this family. But there may be more, uh, right? There is th th these things exist in the cosmological modeling, uh, so so there may be more of them, and and this, that's why uh, the one that we found is is so interesting. So here's the summary of this: what we call the giant coma stream. It's a stellar stream, is morphology and brightness similar to the stellar streams detected in the Milky Way, uh, but it's at 500 kiloparsec distance. Uh, sorry, it's 500 kiloparsec long. It's at 100 megaparsec distance. It's completely featureless, uh, looking at the data we have. And then we plan to use future generation telescopes like the ELT, the TMT, and the GMT uh, that we really need to further explore the stream. Because it's so faint, we need the very largest telescope. And the question is, are such cold, uh, giant cold streams common in galaxy clusters? We know the small ones are, because they're around our galaxy and, and in our galaxy. Uh, but th this is really a giant stream. So are those common elsewhere? So the paper. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I yes. have a question. Yeah. Uh, I see also other similar structures, smaller ones, uh, in the picture, uh, like one on the right, uh, vertical. Are those, these are streams also? Uh, do you refer to this kind of things? Uh, yes, for example. Those are those are spikes that come from bright stars. Uh -huh. Is this all, the only all the, the uh, all the stars have these associated to them? Uh huh. Uh, so so anywhere else, what, yeah, I see even below eh, uh, things that lines that look like this okay, one. Yes, 
So you think uh, this is the the only one you see in this picture? The, yeah, the only one of 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 this length and this brightness. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the thing with this kind of imaging, uh, because the CCD pixels are aligned uh, top to bottom, everything that's vertical uh -huh. is suspect, and it's probably due to CCD effects. Uh -huh. Right, like all these stellar spikes. This is just uh, this is uh, charge transferring into CCDs. Uh, that's why you have a bright source. You get these you get these uh, these spikes. But everything that's that's vertical is suspect. This thing is definitely not vertical. It runs across uh, different exposures, different CCDs, uh, and that that's why it's different from the others. Uh, well, then there's I all guess kind you, of... you're going to speak more about it now. Explain what it's like, what it what it's no, made. No, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna change to another topic. So this is your chance to ask about this one. That's a, <laughs> so it's, it's just it's it's a stream. It's something. Uh, Moving there in different velocity than anywhere else, uh, right? V velocity no. we don't know. Uh, what we what we think is similar are the streams that we know on our own Milky Way, uh, which which are remnants of past interactions. Uh -huh. uh, so what this probably is is a, is a shredded uh, a shredded galaxy from a past interaction, probably with the cluster, maybe with one of the galaxies around it. Uh, but it it is very very large. It's five hundred yeah. kiloparsec. We can't okay, really I, put the mass right. on it yet. I understand. So the word stream does not mean some kind of flowing motion or something. Uh, it, 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 it looks like it. The terminology comes from, from the Milky Way uh, e e equivalent. Okay. Uh, here we, we don't know, and, and we don't know what the velocity is, uh, whether it's actually streaming, as you ask, <laughs> that, that we, don't, we simply don't know yet. Okay, thank you. You just an answered my question, Johan. Uh, uh, I was going to ask, what do you think this is? You just said that it, is, it could be a, uh, uh, a galaxy that was uh, torn apart. Okay. Yep, All right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Let me continue to the, the second example. Uh, that there's there's a lot going on with deep imaging, as you might expect. We find all kinds of things, both in galaxies, outside galaxies. Uh, so here's here's one other example, and I'm just plugging the work of uh, of Javier Roman, who's, who's who's our postdoc, as well. So nuclear star clusters are compact regions of dense stars found in the centers of many galaxies. They typically contain a few million to a billion stars, have sizes of only a few parsecs, and these NSCs are important because they play a crucial role in the formation and evolution of galaxies, contributing to the growth of supermassive black holes, regulate star formation and they also affect the dynamics of the host galaxy. And then they also probe the early stages of galaxy formation and the physical conditions in the central regions of galaxies. And galaxies in denser environments are known to have a higher fraction of these nuclear star clusters. So um, the formation pathways uh, widely supported by observational uh, evidence, simulations, analysis of stellar populations is, is a globular cluster coalescence where globular clusters in the galaxy can come together in the center uh, and, and, and form a nuclear star cluster. But the timescales for this process are of order of a few mega years. And there's no observational evidence of this progress because it's so fast. Uh, right? this, this, this is supposed to happen. It's been modeled in detail by the authors you see here. Uh, and, and this, is, this is expected to happen. The globular clusters will come together in the center but it's really too fast to observe so far. The alternative pathway is in situ star formation, which is illustrated by this little nuclear ring at the lower left, uh, where, where the nuclear star cluster just, just forms because many stars form there. Um, so we look, we're looking here at the, at the globular cluster coalescence model, uh, which has not been observed, but maybe we're observing it here now. So this is our galaxy, UTC 7346, located in the periphery of the Virgo cluster, stellar mass about a billion solar masses. It's got no sign of star formation. There's no gas, no H alpha, uh, but it's got a peculiar morphology. Uh, it may, may have shells uh, indicating a, a possible interaction. And it's got a concentration of point sources in the very center, which you can't really see in this image, but, but there's sort of hints of it already in this image here. So this is strange that there's a galaxy with no uh, with no gas, with no star formation, not much going on, but it's got these little pinpoints of light very close to the center. So what we then did is yeah. is make a two any, component. Sorry, any evidence of a black hole somewhere there? Uh, I 
I don't know, but it, it might as well have one because most galaxies have one and this is a 10 to the nine solar mass galaxy. So there might be a small one there. Uh, I don't know if we have so, evidence for it actually. This is the furthest away we have seen so far, furthest away from from the Earth that we have we have observed these galaxies. Sorry, in in what sense? Sorry, the further uh, furthest away from us, further further than any other galaxies. No, uh, the, uh, not the no, galaxy the... itself. The no. I'll, I'll I'll come to the global okay. cluster in okay. a minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we, we start with a two component decomposition. I'll go quick here and we subtract a, a two component model. So here's the, here's the original image of the galaxy. Here's the main model. Uh, we need a second component. We subtract it. And here we see this, what I refer to as, as shells, which may indicate past interactions. So this is extra light at these locations that we can't explain with a, a, a simple model uh, with these two components. Uh, and then we, we see we see these shells here, uh, also shown there, and then they've got the, then we've got these point sources. So this is what we think may be uh, globular clusters. Uh, so they're candidates. We can look at their colors, and we we really think that they are good candidates for globular clusters. Those are the green uh, the green circles here in the image, and and the 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 red and the blue circles here indicate. Uh, the, the sizes of the main components. So it's the effective radii of the two components of the galaxy. And what we find is that the typical radius for uh, globular clusters here is, is uh, very small. So the globular clusters are concentrated compared to the galaxy and compared to other galaxies. So this is very anomalous. Most globular clusters are, are not as strongly concentrated in the center at all as in these galaxies, right? Typical values, in fact, are more than twice as large, uh, where the, the global cluster typical radius is, is uh, similar to the effective radius. Um, and what we also find, but this personally I find is uh, less significant, uh, but you, you can see a coincidence of the positive flux residuals in our image uh, with the location of the globular clusters. That's shown here. Where's my mouse? Uh, these are the globular clusters, these little circles on the bottom right. And they, they tend to coincide with the brighter regions, uh, which are these, these shell remnants that we find after we subtract the model from our galaxy. So there's two anomalies here. Uh, one is that this thing may be a dwarf-dwarf merger, which are the, these, these remnants of tidal features that we see there. And the other weird thing it has is that the globular clusters are very much concentrated towards the center. And putting those together, uh, our our, uh, our idea is that this may be a dwarf merger, uh, which is causing the collapse of the globular clusters towards the center. And if we see that happening, it would mean that this is a nuclear star cluster in formation. Uh, and I will skip all this because, except for the last sentence, I, I, I'm running out of time very quickly. Uh, so what we what we Proposed now is follow-up observations uh, with WEAVE on the on the four meter telescope in La Palma. This is a large uh, integral field unit. And what we aim to show there is a kinematic decoupling of the two stellar components uh, and the high resolution imaging of the galactic center population, which we want to uh, get with HST. And those are the proofs that we need uh, to, to, to prove our model. Uh, but we may be seeing it as nuclear star cluster information, uh, which, which would be a first because this globular cluster collapse happens very fast. But we may be witnessing it here in this dwarf dwarf merger. Uh, so I, I want to move on to the really the second part of this talk, uh, which, which is on big data. It's the future of astronomy. And on this, you know what a megabyte is, you know what a gigabyte is, you know what a terabyte is. A terabyte fits on your, well, maybe it fits in your phone phone nowadays. It certainly fits on your desk as an external backup drive. Uh, but the Vera Rubin Observatory's LSST, the Legacy Survey in Space of Time, will produce about 20 terabytes of data every night. But over its 13 years lifetime, now suddenly we're talking about 100 petabytes. 20 terabytes, you can imagine, it fits on your desk, it fits on your local computer. But over 30 years lifetime, every night 20 terabytes, you're talking about 100 petabytes. The square kilometer array will produce the next level, that's one exabyte of data every second. Although admittedly that's raw data, so nobody will ever see that. That is what goes into the correlators. But these are massive data rates uh, that, we, that we're coming up to. 
and compare this. This I found this somewhere uh, that the, the the human memory uh, is of order a gigabyte. That's more or less what we have in our memory on on everything. You know, smells, books that we read, people that we know. Uh, it's about a, a gigabyte. One terabyte is equivalent to about two million books, uh, which is something you can imagine, but it's a big number. Uh, you know, <laughs> reading two million books is no mean feat. And the human bandwidth is estimated to be of order a terabyte per year. Uh, that, that's the information we receive during a year is about a terabyte. And almost all of that is what we'd call video. It's what we see through our eyes. And the rest is what we hear and what we smell and what we taste, et cetera, and what we read. So the conclusion is, uh, looking at these massive data rates is that we really need machines to help us process all these data. There is no way that that we can uh, process this in, in our minds and in our memories. And the tools that we use for that are machine learning, artificial intelligence, of course, not only in astronomy. Uh, if you look at autonomous cars, for instance, they need to process of order 10 terabyte of data for an eight hour driving shift. So those are tremendous amounts of data that we need to produce. And this also shows you how clever we are because we can drive an, a car for eight hours and we don't have any problem with memory or bandwidth. Uh, we can just do that. So um, AI is, is becoming very powerful and useful, but it does have dangers and pitfalls. I just want to mention ChatGPT, which I hope you've all played with and, and maybe using. It's very, very powerful. I, I really love it. It's very, very good. It writes very well. Uh, but the problem is that that it, it invents uh, it invents things when it doesn't know. Uh, so, the, and this is under limitations, uh, right? Examples are given their capabilities. It, it's very, very good. It remembers everything. Uh, it, it can follow up conversations. Uh, it, it, it knows what not to say, uh, but it's got limitations. It may generate incorrect information. Uh, it, it may also produce harmful instructions or biased content. And it, it's lim knowledge of the world maybe last year was limited to, uh, to to everything that happened up to 2021. Uh, a lot of this is repairable. Uh, there's an interesting paper by a, a, an astronomy PhD student published uh, earlier this year, uh, where he, he asked uh, ChatGPT to help him write his paper. And he, he makes this, this uh, student makes remarks saying, no such paper exists. Uh, two authors that were uh, mentioned by ChatGPT never published together, and the title of this paper is fictitious. And then he asked for more papers, and he said all the papers it provides, it being ChatGPT, have eerily similar titles, and not a single one does actually exist. The titles are intriguing, even the brief summary sounds sound, sound plausible. So what ChatGPT can do is is sound very very convincing and it invents all kinds of details that that if you look at it you may think well this this looks really true but it may not be true so that's the limitation that we're obviously having here now ChatGPT is being developed very very quickly uh, so in in a year or two you may look at this slide and say oh you know this guy he didn't know any better when he wrote this uh, it is very very powerful I think we must all use it uh, at least to see what's going on uh, it's also a lot of fun to use it. But we have to be aware that that it uh, it may make mistakes. Now, this development, of course, is not just in astronomy. It happens everywhere, biology, medicine, etc. And what we're talking about is is data science, which sitting here in the middle between the domain expertise, which in our case is astronomy, uh, with mathematics and computer science. So we, we're in in the data science, and in astronomy, this is also referred to as astroinformatics. And it really is a paradigm shift in science. If you compare, you know, people might, like me, I've been doing research long enough uh, to recognize this from when I started and uh, some in the audience can do this as well. Uh, and, and we see a massive increase in the data volumes becoming so large that most data will never be seen by humans. Uh, when I started, I actually looked at my CCD images and basically looked at every pixel because I only had two or three. Now the data sets are so large that most data will never be seen. But that's not it. Also, there's an increase in information content, right? which merely means that we get so much data now in so many different dimensions that we move from hypothesis-driven to data-driven science, where hypothesis-driven science is where you do an experiment to test a certain hypothesis or theory, and then you analyze the data you, you obtained from the experiment you designed 
to data data driven where you just have data and you might as well look at it and see what happens and one example was the uh, the, the the large stream in coma uh, this just happens to sit there we didn't set up the survey to find it we just found it so this is data driven science so are we changing the scientific method that's another talk uh, and the third column, the third uh, paradigm shift uh, here is is the increase in data complexity. Uh, right, we we're not just getting more data; the data is getting much more complex, and we we can find patterns that we cannot comprehend. Uh, right, if if you know, we can comprehend things in in three dimensions, and and some of you are clever enough to maybe get more dimensions. But if you're talking about uh, 10 dimensions, 20, 30, there are things that we cannot comprehend. And maybe something like ChatGPT can easily find patterns there and say, well, this is what's going on, but we couldn't comprehend it. So it's data volumes that is increasing, information content, and also data complexity. Um, what we do is we use AI and machine learning to handle these large data sets. And there's three examples. Uh, find, I'll have a look at the time, yes. We try to find needles in haystacks. Uh, we try to explore large and complex data sets, and we try to explore the intersection of data simulations and computer science. So the needles in haystacks, uh, we, we did this by looking at um, using convolutional neural networks to look at tidal features in deep optical galaxy images. Now, not of one galaxy, as I showed you before, but of many. Uh, and Dominguez Sanchez and collaborators used 6,000 simulated features uh, to train their network. And this is simulated from what we will find in Euclid and LSST. And uh, Elena found that CNNs work well in recovering features from the test images. But then if we give the, the same system that works well on the, on, the model, on, the, on the simulated images, if we give the system real images, it does significantly worse. Uh, and it, it's not quite understood why that is because the simulations are pretty good and they should simulate the real images. But then when you go to the real imaging, it doesn't really work. And it's probably because the simulated image is not realistic enough, uh, lower special resolution, they don't include the right background effects and several other things. And this really is a warning uh, that using CNNs on the upcoming images is not trivial. Uh, and as, as you might expect, when we set out to, to do this work, uh, we were hoping for the opposite conclusion uh, that we would show that we could actually use CNNs uh, to, on, on Euclid and LSD images to find tidal features. But the conclusion is almost the opposite, uh, that things are not going to be not going to be easy. Uh, exploring large and complex data sets. Uh, I want to highlight the work of our PhD student, Regina Sarmiento here, supervised uh, by Mark Huerta's company and myself. And, and she used... Uh, Contrastive learning, which is a, a form of self-supervised deep learning. And this is a machine learning algorithm that extracts information from multidimensional data sets. And what it does is maximize the agreement between information extracted from augmented versions of the same input data. So you take an image, for instance, and you rotate it, and then you learn, the, 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 the algorithm learns that this is the same image, that all that's happened is it's rotated or all that happens is this become more noisy. So this is what we call augmented versions of the same data. Whereas if I give it to really different galaxies, then it has to uh, it really has to recognize that these are different galaxies. Um, this is useful in astronomy because we have a lot of instrumental effects uh, like rotations, like noise, et cetera. So what Regina used is the Manga data set uh, which is integral field spectroscopy of about 10,000 galaxies of all types. And specifically what we used is five images, image products that came out of the survey. So there's the V-band image, an age map of a galaxy, metallicity map, line of sight velocities, and a velocity dispersion map. So there are five maps for each of these 10,000 galaxies. And we threw that into uh, this contrastive learning algorithm. And what it does is it, it, finds, um, it finds differences in the physical parameters and it sort of ignores the non-physical parameters. And here you see two columns on the left and two on the right. Uh, the one with the red cross is, is PCA. So this is a, a different technique, a principal component analysis. And this is our SIM CLR, which has the green tick. And what you see here is uh, 
is a, is a representation of the data. Uh, so to, the axes here mean nothing. The axes are, are invented by the, by the algorithm. The color coding does mean something. So this is, for instance, the first two images here, this uh, color coded by physical size. So the larger galaxies are bluer here. Uh, and and let's, let's look at this one, for instance. This is quite clear, the, the fourth uh, from the top, uh, the age map. So now the oldest galaxies are red and the youngest galaxies are blue. And you see that the SIMCLR separates these galaxies. Again, the axes mean nothing, uh, but it does separate the galaxies. It finds the old galaxies and puts them all together in the same region of the diagram. The PCA can't do this. You know, principal component analysis spreads all these old galaxies into different areas of the, of the diagram. And in general, on the left, these are the physical parameters. You see that they are separated. The colors are separated uh, here. Then if we go to the right, these are the non-physical parameters. This is, for instance, the number of fibers at the top. Uh, the manga survey uses different numbers of fibers for its observations. Uh, this is the size of the galaxy. Then we have the number of zero level pixels, the position angle, and the right ascension of galaxies. And you can see that uh, the, the PCA technique, uh, principal component analysis, is very sensitive to these, right? Because it, it, it thinks here that it has a great success and says, oh, look, these galaxies are different from those galaxies. But they're not. It's a number of fibers that they've obse been observed with that's different. And SimCLR, this is the strength of this method. It ignores these instrumental effects, these non-physical effects, right? It mixes all these galaxies up. So it's not sensitive to the non-physical parameters, but it is sensitive to the, to the physical parameters that we see on the left. Once we've done that, we can do a clustering analysis. Uh, so we plot these galaxies. Now the axes do mean something. This is, for instance, mass uh, versus star formation rate. So this is the, 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 the red cloud of galaxies, et cetera. And we see that if we do a clustering analysis, just taking the representation that SimCLR finds and asking it to define three, uh, three groups of galaxies, those three groups of galaxies actually have different physical parameters. Uh, one is blue star-forming galaxies, which are less massive, and the other is red, uh, less star-forming and more massive galaxies. And you can see that in all of these plots, uh, for instance, this is uh, age map, versus velocity dispersion, you can see that these three galaxies actually separate in the physical parameters. So that's what this works. Uh, it's not sensitive to non-physical parameters, but it is sensitive to physical parameters. And then finally, I want to mention our new um, network. This is a doctoral network, a training network uh, funded under the Marie Skorowski Curie Actions from the EU. And here we want to explore the intersection of data simulations and computer science. So this is a new network that's starting on the 1st of January. Uh, we're coordinating this from the IEC with nine academic nodes, 11 partners and two and a half million euro budget from Europe. We have five astronomy nodes and five computer science nodes uh, across Spain, Italy, France, UK, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, and in the USA. And we're now hiring 11 PhD candidates for a PhD start in, uh, in summer 2024. Uh, so the, the web page is below and the advert is there as well. If, if you are or know uh, good uh, MSc students interested in working on this, uh, in this uh, field between computer science and astronomy, please apply or please suggest that they apply. The overall objectives is develop and implement object detection algorithms and then use them to detect and identify the faintest galaxies uh, residing in the different environments from the new large-scale photometric and integral field spectroscopic surveys. Uh, and mainly we want to use Euclid, LSST, and WEAVE data, and just find the kind of uh, features that I explained to you at the beginning of the talk, uh, but find them automatically. So get our object detection algorithms, basically to ignore everything that is not physical, like these spikes on stars, but find, uh, detect, identify the faintest galaxies and the faintest galaxy components. Second objective is to characterize the morphology, populations, and spatial distributions of large samples of dwarf galaxies, uh, again, automatically. So using object recognition and parameter distribution analysis of complex data sets, and with that, confront simulations of galaxy evolutions. So this is really taking the next step 
in constructing very large samples of dwarf galaxies from Euclid LSST imaging, and again, doing this automatically. And third is define the chemodynamical coevolution of dwarf satellite galaxies and the giant hosts, and then uh, look at the symbiosis between the Milky Way and its cohort of dwarf galaxies uh, to, to, to compare that to galaxies outside our local group. And this is using mainly Weave and Gaia data. So conclusions of the presentation, just to summary, I told you that the structure and morphology of galaxies use powerful clues to the formation and evolution. Uh, I've shown you that deep imaging is subject to several systematic effects, but they can be handled with care. Faint structures in galaxies can unveil crucial uh, clues to their formation and early evolution. Major changes are happening in science, including in astronomy, and advanced machine learning and AI techniques can provide physical insights from huge data sets. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Many thanks, many thanks, Johan, for the very nice talk. I, I believe we are at the beginning of a new era of doing research with these artificial intelligent techniques and all that stuff. And of course, we have to be careful. I had the same experience as the one you uh, have shown us about the, uh, the false uh, citation or reference. Uh, when I was testing uh, ChatGPT, well, in the beginning, I asked him to perform some mathematics that I could uh, control the algorithm to see if, ans if the answers are correct or not. And then uh, the next question was, uh, can you tell me something about the Tremaine-Weinberg method? So just like this. And the answer was very correct. He has, uh, since I have uh, printed it out, it was in uh, one page text. All Everything was correct. But then I have spotted a reference I, I didn't know. And uh, I was trying to, to find the, the names of the authors were known, the title, well, I didn't know the paper. I looked at the ADS, it was not there. And the funny thing was that when I went to the volume of the journal to find it, it was that clever to put as the page for the uh, for the paper, the, the not existing paper, the f the uh, the f uh, one paper after the last paper, one page, uh, one one page, page. after the last page in the volume. So he knew he what knew. was the, it knew it knew <laughs> it knew <laughs> it knew what the last page of the volume right. was. So to make it uh, looking very realistic. So well, anyway. Uh, all these were very interesting if there are uh, questions. Uh, uh, what I, I, I'm particularly interested in is we have shown these nuclear cluster things and I was wondering how deep we can go inside the nuclear rings of galaxies to, to find structures in there. For instance, uh, people are for years looking for the predicted by the theory leading spiral arms that should be there, but due to the presence of the black hole, I don't know what, uh, they are not. Uh, and things like that, or another uh, place that, uh, uh, in another location that of galaxies that people should look, I think I would be personally very interested in, is away from the equatorial plane. If there are very faint structure as extension of the peanut and all that stuff, uh, all these are really, really very interesting things to do try to, to find out questions. There are some questions in uh, Okay. Uh, I, I don't mind to challenge your program here, but I was wondering how large is your dwarf galaxy samples? And my question is, uh, you are mentioning uh, advanced uh, machine learning techniques. I, I understand that what you showed us are pretty standard uh, clustering uh, techniques uh, with K means distancing between the different uh, galaxies. So I was wondering, are you sure that you need that you really need uh, five PhD students in astronomy and five PhD students in computer science? Uh, I would claim that you only need one plus one, but I, I may be completely wrong. So how did you estimate that you need ten people at least to to, to run this work? You're using standard techniques from the from the literature, and you why don't you? tell one student, run all the galaxies through that and do a clustering and see what where you get. So I, I may be missing something because you, you've done your homework to, to, you know, to advertise 11 positions there. So 
Okay. Right. Thank you. Now, the, the, what I showed you, the, the, the clustering analysis, et cetera, that's completely standard. You're right. Uh, but we use that on the output of contrastive learning. And the paper I highlighted was published, I think, two years ago. That was the second paper in astronomy uh, using contrastive learning. And we were beaten, I think, two weeks uh, by a group in California who were the first to apply this in, in astronomy. Um, of course, uh, the software life cycle in machine learning is something like six months. This is incredibly fast moving. Uh, so the, the technique that I wanted to highlight is the contrastive learning. What comes out of that, then, of course, as you as you point out, that goes into completely standard uh, representation techniques and completely standard, uh, you know, K clustering, etc. That's completely standard. That was something that we have done uh, over the past years with a PhD student here at the IEC. Uh, the network itself, uh, that's a completely different level. Uh, this is this in includes um, it includes ma mathematical morphology techniques that are new and are leading in computer science. Uh, and it also includes the, the machine learning uh, and, and AI approaches. So I haven't spoken about those techniques yet. Uh, what you've seen is a little bit of something that we've been doing over the past few years. Thank you very much. So if is there anyone else in here else uh, who wants uh, to ask? Uh, was a hand, uh, Nico? Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Someone else raised their hand. Yeah, yes, please just go ahead and then. Well, do oh. you want to ask something or not? No. Yeah, no. I, I want to ask a question, but I see another hand, Harris Tsakonas. Well, okay, ask and then uh, Harris Tsakonas will ask uh, after you. So, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Uh, that was a very interesting, very interesting lecture for some of us who uh, are not in the field. But and I, I wanted to ask uh, some, something simple. Uh, the, uh, how far are these galaxies from us? Are they the furthest away that we can see? Uh, no, no, they're not. Uh, uh -huh. I, I spoke about the local group and uh -huh. then the coma cluster galaxies I spoke about. It's about 100 megaparsec. That is still, in cosmological terms, that's our back garden. That's still very close. Uh, that's right still very close. close. So I'm not talking about galaxies, about at higher redshifts. Galaxies moving away, expanding of the universe and so on, so far away. That, I mean, yeah. These galaxies are expanding. Uh, they're moving away from us, but they're still they're still very close in, in a wider cosmological uh, framework. And even the dwarf galaxies that we, we aim to classify and find they're still at this kind of distances, probably around 100 megaparsecs. Uh, what, what you see nowadays uh, as new results from HST, where they're talking about the furthest galaxies, you know, the redshift 10, 15, possibly galaxies, uh, those are much, much further away than what, what we're looking at. And yes, and earlier and in, in, in later in time, I guess, they, they evolved later in time. Right. Yeah. That since we are. Yes. I see. So, but we don't see any structures forming, like spirals or uh, something like they didn't seem to have a, a distinct structure. Uh, because maybe. I've I've showed you galaxies without spiral structure, uh, but uh -huh. the spiral structure is certainly completely formed at this kind of distances and times that I showed you the coma cluster, for instance. Uh, the the debate with and and that's really being changed now a lot with new uh, James Webb data. Uh, that's been coming out over the past past two years or so, uh, mm -hmm. is is when structures formed in galaxies, and and we used to think that was maybe around a redshift of a few, uh, and now there are indications that this might have happened much earlier. So you can have spiral structure forming much earlier than 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 a redshift of a few, uh, but that's a that's a different uh, field and a different approach to what I'm doing here. Uh, I see. And when I speak to uh, when I speak about uh, confronting observations with cosmological models, uh, I would look at basically current day remnants of the early formation and early evolution, uh, which could be tidal streams that were formed uh, several giga years ago and are basically still hanging there because they're dynamically relaxed and they can survive for a long time. So I would be looking at remnants of, of processes that happened in the early universe uh, and another approach is to try and look directly at galaxies in the early universe uh, with, with, for instance, James Webb data. 
Thank you very much. Okay, then we go on with Harris and then with Tutku. Harris, go ahead. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, very, very nice talk. Actually, I'm interested about this uh, tidal stream, this giant tidal stream. So yeah, can you tell if this is connected, I mean, spatially at least, to any galaxy nearby? I mean, does this thing falls into a galaxy or this is just randomly, I don't know, in the in, in the field? Where was it? There. Yeah. All we know is is that it's sitting there. Okay. Right. Whether it's connected to anything, your guess is as good as mine. For instance, if if you see, I I hope you can see my 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 yes uh, yes yes pointer. Yes. It it sort of coincides with the location of these two galaxies. Is it connected there? No idea. It's got something branching off there. No idea. This galaxy, I don't know. Uh, we don't know. What we then checked, of course is that it, it can only be connected to the coma cluster in all reason. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so it, it's something to do with the coma cluster. Uh, it's not foreground. It's not serious. Uh, it's not resolved into stars. So it's probably at that distance. But really, of course, as usual in astronomy, now what we need is spectroscopic confirmation. The problem is this thing is so faint. Where was it? Uh, where is it? Here. All right, the, the, the top of this curve, the brightest part of it is below mm. 29 magnitude per square second. So to get spectroscopy of this without an ELT is, is quite impossible. Uh, so yes, there's a lot of, uh, oops, wrong way. No, that way. Um, those are very good questions that you're asking. I think those are the key questions, but there's, there's only so much we can do with basically one image uh, where we see this stream. Okay, okay, impressive. Nevertheless, yeah. nevertheless, really impressive. Also, okay. another thing that we have shown us with a spiral galaxy grand design thing and had one stream like that, also like a straight line, straight line segment going away of it or adjoined to that. Remember, so the appearance of these structures also in the in in this uh, in the same in the same image that you have here, just below the two galaxies, there are also two straight line segments con to the to the one below so you see i don't know if uh, can you see the cursor no whatever so where uh, do you refer to in this image yeah, yeah in, in uh, just uh, to the right and below here they, they're just below you see this one and then that one okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah so it is, uh, yeah uh, the are not used to have uh, uh, straight lines on the sky. <laughs> right. I, the, the, there is a thing, of course, our eye is very good at picking up straight lines. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, but yes, this is... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, Tutku, go on. Can I ask Tuz, now that we are here, I got distracted. So I would also like to see whether if this like cold stream structure can be related to run pressure stripping, but I don't know, like, because it, to me, like when I look right now, it actually goes from darker to fainter and kind of connects to this galaxy that's like further away from these other kind of tiny group there. So I would be interested to see, but I guess you do need spectroscopic mm. data to sort of like associate that to anything, like any enhancements or something. But like, I was wondering whether, but if, can it be related to lensing or anything like that? Or not really? Uh, I, th I think it's too big for that. And that would also be part of my answer to your first question, which again, it's, yes, it's interesting. And, and it's, it's gonna be hard to, to prove that or disprove it. But keep in mind, this thing is half a megaparsec long. This is 500 kiloparsec, so it's really huge. And these galaxies that you see here on top of them, oh, oh there's my mouse there. These are big galaxies. Mm -hmm. These are these are very big galaxies by themselves. Uh, so this thing, 500 kiloparsec long, whether you can get it from ram pressure stripping, I doubt it. Uh, so this, yeah. I don't know. It might depend how rich the galaxy is in gas and how slow mm. it's moving, how dense the, that part of the environment is. But yeah, it is huge. It's giant. Maybe, maybe um, one way forward would be to look in more detail in the in the 
simulations, which we haven't done yet. We identified that there is something similar in the simulations. What we haven't done yet is exactly find out why it's in the simulation and, and what its origin is. And that might be a way to, to get closer to, to explaining what it is and why it's there. Sure. Another question of me is actually related to the algorithms, the machine learning part. So there will be like, when you're looking at the morphologies and stuff, there will be a lot of structures that look alike, like tidal streams or like ground pressure stripping signs and so on. How are you planning to train the algorithm to associate between different kinds of interaction? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And we've seen it already in this image uh, where, where, where someone asked about, you know, these possible Mm -hmm. uh, straight things uh, and this is what i try to indicate with the contrastive learning there are algorithms that are learning to do this and they're becoming more intelligent in the sense that if if you would ask a standard algorithm to find straight straight looking segments in this image the algorithm would be very quick and very happy and and happily bring you back about a hundred of these straight lines and say oh look i found loads of them Right, but they're all connected to stars. And we know once you've seen this as a human, you know, okay, these are stellar streaks. We don't want these. We want things like, like this. Um, so there are algorithms that, that are, are being developed that can distinguish between one thing and another. But again, this is, this is my, my chat GPT remark, really. How can we trust these things? Because most machine learning algorithms uh, are all kinds of things, but they're not reproducible. Uh, it's a black box. You get an answer and you have no idea why the answer arrives. So this is our question, right? I, I can I can get results from an algorithm. And especially if this happens in six or eight or 10 dimensions, if I can't comprehend what it actually is, and I mean, myself personally, I'm an observer. I want to see stuff in an image. If I can't see it and I need to believe what the algorithm tells me is happening, then I think at ChatGPT was all its invented references and invented clauses. Uh, th that is part of the problem, but there are algorithms now being developed uh, that will that will that are getting better at distinguishing uh, different uh, families of what you might see. Which, of course, for us, it's physical and non-physical is the first uh, separation that we need to make as astronomers. Uh, which, again, here is the illustration. Right, this is a this is a non-physical straight segment, and this we think is a physical, more or less straight segment. Uh, so that's the first the first separation. And then we need to go further and see if if you give me a catalog of what, what the algorithm says are dwarf galaxies, can I be sure that they're all dwarf galaxies? And are they actually anything similar uh, internally, these these uh, all these objects? So so yeah, these are these are the big questions. <laughs> Thank you. It was nice to see you as well. Thank you, and nice to see you, yes. One more question from the audience. I'd like to ask a philosophical question. I would like to know your opinions, uh, whether you believe, if you believe, and how soon you believe uh, that uh, this software will replace 100% the work of professional astronomers. If, and if yes, how soon? <laughs> so I, I'm going to ask this question to everyone who talks about these issues because I'm wondering myself. So what is your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, what I would say today is no way because it, it's just too stupid. That's what you see in chat GPT. I mean, it happily invents stuff. It happily tells you things that are not true. It, it, it puts ridiculous phrases like saying, well, it could be this, but it also could be something else. And we need ideas. I mean, that's what we do as, as a group. You know, we come up with ideas. Uh, I, I give you an idea. You give me an idea. Something happens. Some brilliant student writes a paper. Uh, this I don't see happening, but this is now. And if you see how fast this is developing, I, I really wonder. Um, I, I don't know. I think we won't be out of a job because there'll, there'll be something else interesting to think of. But it's, uh, it, it, is a, it is a very interesting philosophical question, and it is worrying. Because uh, yeah. if you see that in, in a couple of decades we've done this, what about a thousand years, two thousand years? <laughs> That's what there. May, may I add something along these lines, this interesting question? Uh, I have recently seen two initials, PI, before neural networks and 
uh, big learning. And PI stands for physics informed, right? I think everybody knows that by now. Uh, and, and to me, that idea of uh, incorporating in the data analysis uh, a physical principle of symmetry uh, that one expects uh, of uh, a certain basic physical law that must be uh, holding, has that, uh, I didn't see that coming in, into your analysis anywhere that, uh, in the big in the data analysis. Is there some idea of using it under the condition that certain physical laws are uh, true? <laughs> um, yes, but this is all, yes. But this is also our main task at the moment to make sure that what comes out is, is physical. Mm. Um, so this is this is how we try to fine tune uh, the algorithms. Uh, in 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 a thing, something I I haven't spoken about. If you train machine learning programs, uh, you tell them what to look out for. Right? This is supervised machine learning. Yes. Uh, so you give them galaxies and you say, well, this is these this is what galaxies look like. That that's what you're referring to. Then you put the physical boundaries on it. Uh, whereas if you let if you let the algorithm completely free. Uh, then mm. it, it will find things that are not physical and say, oh, this, these are interesting galaxies, but they're not. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so you, do, is... you do give them some information to be based on. Some uh, yes, I, either before or after. The, the, the philosophical question is what happens when you can't control that anymore? <laughs> that's the question we just had from the audience. I mean, that's, that's the big question which I can't answer. I can just hope for the best. <laughs> Okay, so let me check if there are more questions. Thank you. No more Thank you questions. very much. I would like to say, good to see you, Johan. It was a very nice and informative talk in many respects. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And very nice to see you again also. So, all of us, thank you very much, Johan. It was great to have and uh well hope that we meet soon <laughs> in person Indeed. okay Indeed. very nice to see you all thank you very much bye bye thank you